Hi everyone and welcome along to the Ergonomically Speaking podcast, the podcast that aims to help you reduce and even eliminate work-related discomfort. I'm your host Neve Pentney of Boyne Ergonomics. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really hope that you're able to take away some useful practical advice from this podcast to help you reduce your own risk of discomfort at the workplace or help manage the risks among the people that you might be responsible for. So now that we know why we're here, let's get started. Hello, 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 and welcome along to episode 21 of the Ergonomically Speaking podcast, where today it's all about the teachers. The last episode, we focused on what we as caregivers can do to help reduce the risk of musculoskeletal discomfort among children and young people. And now we're going to focus on the educators. So to paraphrase Maud Flanders, won't somebody please think of the teachers? These are the guys who are responsible for the most part for educating our children and essentially taking care of them during the day. And we want them to be well. We want them to be able to do the best that they can do in the classroom with minimal pain and minimal discomfort. So what I'm going to look at here in this episode is what are the risk factors that teachers face and what can we do as teachers, as educators to reduce the risk? The one thing I will say about teachers are a really really multifaceted job there is a lot more to it than just the classroom and unfortunately there is a lot outside of your control but equally there is a lot you can do to help so we're going to have a look at this teaching itself it's a demanding job physically demanding cognitively demanding and tiring and the things that have been found to influence teacher health and teacher well-being and quality of life essentially are their working conditions their musculoskeletal comfort and psychological well-being. And they all link in together. They all link in together. So musculoskeletal disorders definitely has been found to be one of the main causes of illness and disability among teachers. And then the other ones are your psychological and behavioral conditions and respiratory conditions. And the, generally speaking, among teachers, the most commonly reported musculoskeletal issues are low back pain, shoulder pain and neck pain. So we're going to look at how we can address them. The other issue that crops up, I won't say that it's solely found on, in teachers, but it is definitely one that is quite common and wouldn't be common in a lot of other jobs, is voice injuries. So the rates of reported voice injuries, depending on kind of what study you look at, it varies from between 10 to 70 percent of teachers. And that's quite a big, quite a big jump, but between 10 and 70 percent, depending on the study report symptoms of voice injury and that includes sore throat, vocal fatigue and hoarseness with in more extreme cases and um, the appearance of vocal nodules. So voice injury is something else we need to consider as well as your back, back, excuse me, neck and shoulder pain. So what are the risks that teachers face when they're teaching? And this obviously, the level of these risks will vary among age groups and ability groups and the scenario and the setting um, and online and in person and all these different things. But in some part, they will exist among all teachers. So the first one I'm going to look at is your repetitive adverse postures. So this is essentially, as it sounds, repeatedly over and over again, getting into postures that cause additional stress or strain on the musculoskeletal system. And as I've said before, Doing this once or twice is not going to cause a problem, but it's the repetitive nature or the prolonged nature, which we'll get into. But if you think of teachers, the most common repetitive, I suppose, adverse posture I can think of is when the teacher's bending down to check on students' work or when you're writing on or when you're cleaning the whiteboards and the blackboards and, and the different boards you have. Also looking at hanging artwork in the classroom, as again, if you have 20, 30 kids in your classroom, which is kind of what we usually have here in Ireland, well, that's 20, 30 pieces of art that have to be hung up and it's normally done in batches. So this could be something that's done quite often too. The one that always springs to my mind, though, of course, is the bending down, the bending down to check on students' artwork or schoolwork. The next one is prolonged static postures. So these are, you know, prolonged periods of sitting, prolonged periods of standing, and this could be when you're preparing the classwork, when you're correcting the classwork, computer use as well, and supervision duties. 
Repetitive movements are present usually when you're correcting classwork or exams, writing on the boards, cleaning the boards, and then again when they're using computers. And when it just speaking on computers, I have been in many classrooms assessing them and trying to adapt them for teachers who have injuries. And one thing that gets very often overlooked is actually the DSE setup. So most teachers will have either a laptop or there's a computer in the class for them to use a desktop. Very little thought is usually given to how that is set up. So I do see a lot of teachers who have adverse computer related postures. So it could be working off a laptop flat on a desk. It could be using a desktop computer on a desk that's not really suitable for use with a chair that's not suitable for use and it's not adjustable or it's not currently fit for purpose. So poor computer postures do exist in the classroom too. Contact stress is another one to think of. So if you think of a busy classroom with kids and you're the teacher and you're moving around and there's a lot of kids moving, there's a lot of furniture. One thing that can happen is an actual acute injury where you a physical acute contact injury, for example, maybe um, catching your thigh off the corner of a desk. That's an injury that can happen. And then, of course, you can have like prolonged cumulative contact stress injuries where you have a part of your body in contact with a surface for a prolonged period over and over again. And that can accumulate and cause a problem, for example, a carpal tunnel injury in the wrist. So the contact stress is another risk that has to be considered. Um, manual handling is one that I find doesn't really spring to people's minds. And when I ask teachers, oh, do you ever do manual handling? They're like, oh, no, that wouldn't be part of my job. I'm like, okay, well, take me through your day. And let's be realistic, manual handling, it is a part of classroom management. So you could be lifting and transporting work to be corrected, bringing copies and books in and home. You could be lifting boxes of toys, boxes of arts and crafts supplies. You probably have to move classroom furniture around. These are all manual handling tasks that are completed. And they're often completed without a whole lot of thought being given to how you're doing them because, you know, a lot of teachers I find don't think of it as part of the job and they just kind of do it absentmindedly while there's other things going on. So, of course, manual handling is a risk that exists when you're a teacher. The other risk that is there are the psychosocial risk factors. So it has been found that depression and psychosocial risk factors can be predictors for musculoskeletal discomfort among teachers. And these factors can include, not limited to, but can include perceived work demands, the high cognitive demand of the job, perceived control over the role itself and the tasks, support from the colleagues and your support staff, emotional demands, and integration, personal and work life balance. Those are psychosocial risk factors that exist for teachers. Now, they exist in every job. You know, everyone, there is a certain level of control people like to have, certain level of support, and you have your work-life balance and emotional demands, and they do exist in teaching also. Voice strain is another risk. When you think about it, teachers are talking pretty much the whole time they're there. So excessive use of the voice, high voice volume, dehydration, and adverse postures and poor ventilation can all contribute to the risk of voice strain and physical injury from a student. So there is a risk in the classroom, especially if there are students present with behavioral conditions that can tend to maybe strike or run or grab or hit others that you may develop an injury related to contact with a student, whether it's a sudden movement you have to make to try and help or restrain or help the student, um, a physical contact from the student, that risk does exist when you're teaching in certain groups. So there's a lot going on in terms of risk factors for teachers and the level at which you will experience these if you're a teacher depends and it will vary so much from the classroom you use, the age group you have, the ability group you have, what the support staff are like, what the principal is like, what's going on in your own life. There's a huge, even within one school, there is a huge variation at the level of which you will see these risk factors, but they are important. And there is a lot that you can do to reduce the risk. So what can you as a teacher do? 
to reduce the risk of musculoskeletal injuries when you are working? Well, the one thing you can do firstly is to reduce repetitive adverse postures. So this is where I was talking about maybe teachers bending over to review work. So when you're reviewing the work, make sure to bend your knees and lower your body to the side of the student. Use a portable stool or pull up a chair to make sure you have a stable base when you're talking to students at their level. And we all know that's really, really important when you're dealing with children and you're dealing with students that you do come to their level. So that is why teachers tend to bend down because you don't really want to be talking down to your students. You want to be at their level. Avoid overreaching and writing above shoulder level when you're writing on and cleaning the board. Some classrooms are equipped. They have sliding or rolling boards and um, interactive whiteboards, smart boards and, and all these different things. And they can be used to help reduce adverse postures. Generally, you're aiming to write between your waist and your shoulder height when you can. Use a laser pointer or an extendable manual pointer to draw attention to certain parts of the board or certain things that might be on the wall, anything that's essentially out of reach. And use a step or a step ladder when hanging artwork and decorations in the classroom. And obviously use these safely so that you're not reaching over shoulder level to try and hang things. And you're not kind of up and down on the tippy toes and stretching really high to try and hang things. Another thing that you can do, and it just depends so much on your ability group and the work, is that you can have, instead of going around student to student and bending down and, and assessing everything, if it's appropriate for what you're doing, again, you can be at your desk and call the students up one by one. That would also work too, but it depends so much on what you're doing, whether that is appropriate or not. To reduce prolonged static postures. Set up the classroom and your lesson plans that in such a way that they allow you to frequently and easily move from the seat of the standing position with regular periods of walking and movement. And this helps the kids too. Like these frequent little breaks and changes of activities will help them too. And a portable lectern can be really, really useful. So you can do your lesson sitting or standing and you have somewhere to put your paperwork or put your tablet in a more appropriate posture so that you can sit or stand. Um, electric sit-stand desks could be useful. I've, I've not seen them in the classroom yet here in Ireland. It may be different in other parts of the world, but in theory, they could be a useful feature um, to allow you to change positions. But walking about the classroom frequently and aiming to be realistically no more than 45 minutes in any one position is really, really, really helpful to reduce static postures. Reduce repetitive movements. So if you're doing computer tasks, when you're using your mouse and keyboard, for example, make sure the wrists are straight, you have a loose grip on the mouse and avoid wiggling the hand, deviating the hand side to side. Let the arm do some of the work when you're operating the mouse and using the keyboard. When you're correcting the work, take regular breaks, at least once every 30 minutes. If you're doing corrections, I would really go for once every 30 minutes and alternate hands. If you're just doing short ticks and short marks, alternate hands, but take regular breaks because marking work again if you have 20 or 30 students and you're marking work that is incredibly repetitive so take regular breaks and alternate hands and then reducing your adverse dse computer postures this will be similar to office space workers so you're looking at screen height make sure when you're sitting upright with your ear over your shoulder you're looking straight ahead the screen is level with your eye line if you're using a laptop you have a stand for it you have a keyboard and a mouse for it. If any computer workstation, classroom or not, you should have a height adjustable chair with an adjustable back support and a, a desk, an appropriate desk where you can get your legs in underneath you to have your feet facing forward, knees facing forward, torso, head all facing forward, a clearance space underneath and stable and big enough for the computer. And that's to allow for your ideal positioning. To reduce the contact stress, make sure you're seated at the appropriate height for the workstations just to make sure you're reducing the contact stress on the wrist. So again, when you're sitting at your workstation, relax shoulder, place the hand on the table surface and there should be no drop in the elbow and you reduce the contact stress then on the forearm and wrist. Where possible, ensure that the classroom layout allows enough spacing between the desk to kind of reduce the risk of you coming in contact with the desk. Reduce the manual handling risk. Now, first thing I'll always say is ask for help. Ask for help. 
if you're doing a manual handling task in the classroom and you lift something and you think that feels a little bit heavy, ask for help. Wait and get someone to help you. Arrange the storage to make sure that the heaviest items are between your waist and shoulder height with lighter items above and below it. And ensure that you use good manual handling technique. Remember, bring your body to the load. Do not plant your feet. Bring your body to the load. Do not bend yourself over the load and try to lift it. Bring your body to the load. Stabilize the core and then try and lift it. Use a wheeled bag for transporting work in and out of school. And as I said, ask for help for anything that you feel that you cannot safely handle. When it comes to psychosocial risk factors, this is normally harder to manage because so much of it is outside your control as the teacher um, and demands change and staff changes and jobs change and personal circumstances change. Generally, if you can get a high level of social support, if you have what you think you perceive as a moderate job demand, like you, you want your job to be somewhat demanding, to be stimulating, um, but a good manageable level of demand and job control, then they have found you should have less stress and less depression, but it's a very, very complicated relationship. A good start is that ensuring that the school itself has appropriate numbers of staff um, for the amount of pupils and activities and roles. Teachers are clear on their roles and are very, very aware of the supports available to them and that the school and the senior staff encourage open and a participatory staff room that people can voice concerns if they need to and know that it will be considered and handled professionally. To reduce the risk of voice injury, well, first thing, it's important to stay hydrated and try and make sure the classroom is well ventilated and take regular breaks from talking. Voice amplifiers can be used. So this increases the volume and the carry of your voice. So normally, I've met a few teachers that use these. It's, it's like a little kind of necklace that hangs around the neck and some have a mic, some don't. But essentially, you, when you talk, it amplifies your voice. So you don't have to speak so loudly and you don't have to push your voice so hard. So in theory, it reduces the strain on the throat. These are really handy when teachers wear masks because obviously masks had a big impact on your voice levels. But voice amplifiers, there's pros and cons with them, but a lot of teachers I know find them great. And ensure good posture. Think your ear over your shoulder. When you're speaking, having a good neck posture will help your voice carry. So think your ear over your shoulder, basically. When it comes to the physical injury from the student, firstly, take time to get to know your students, any potential behavioral issues and triggers, and get to know your surroundings. When possible, for teachers or for students, apologies, with behavioral issues, aim to not turn your back on the student, especially those who are known to physically express their emotions. Because if you are, if there is, for an example, contact from a student, you're more likely to injure yourself if you don't, if it's coming from behind and you can't brace yourself from it. The other thing I want to say and I forgot to put it into adverse postures, but one thing to consider, if you are doing a lot of tablet work or if you are correcting a lot of work, a writing slope is a really, really useful tool because you can just pop it on the desk, pop the paperwork on it, get the angle that you want it. And it just means that the, the work you're correcting and the work you're reviewing or writing is not flat on the table. It's angled upwards, it's elevated and angled towards you. And it's really good for reducing adverse postures of the neck associated with paper-based tasks. So have a look at that. These are just some general adaptations and adjustments that can help. What I will say is if you are a teacher and if you are experiencing musculoskeletal discomfort, early intervention is so, so important because I find with classroom environments, it's not usually as straightforward as an office to adapt. Normally, there's a bit of negotiation or there's a bit of planning that has to go into it. And what you don't want to happen is something that has become a mild niggle to develop into something that is chronic and debilitating. So if you have a musculoskeletal discomfort and you're a teacher, you need to flag it with the principal and with the school staff and to ensure early intervention. And generally speaking, if something is mild and you can kind of catch it in time and make changes, it shouldn't become a bigger problem. But what happens, unfortunately, is when things become worse 
and things become chronic and things become debilitating, more needs to be done to fix it. So it is really important because your job is, teachers' jobs are very demanding. They are very, very stressful. And the demands just vary so, so greatly. But usually if you get it early, there are things that can be done to stop any musculoskeletal condition becoming worse. So that is what we can do to manage ergonomic risk. Now, that's just a very, very general guideline. Um, as I said, I have worked with teachers in classrooms who've been coming back to work following injuries and following accidents and making adaptations to let them return to work safely. And there is plenty of things you can do that are not included on this. This was just a very general guide to what you can do to reduce your risk of something developing in the classroom. But of course, if you already have an injury, there are things we can tailor and things you can recommend to change it up. So thank you so much for listening to this. I do hope you got something from it. If, you, if you're a teacher or if you know any teachers and they're having issues, please send them this way and let them have a listen. There is a blog related to this on my website, as always, that has images that people might find useful. My social media links I'll put in the show notes, as well as the link to the blog and my email address. If anyone has any topics you want me to cover, please get in touch and let me know. Um, the next podcast episode, we're going to take a small dive into what ergonomics can do to help neurodivergent employees in the workplace. And I'm really looking forward to doing that one because this is of huge interest to me and I've been working on it for a while. So that's going to be the next episode. In the meantime, I hope you stay well. I hope you have a great week and I look forward to you joining me for the next episode. Thank you.